Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Breeden. Uh, I draw the comic that's called The Devil's Panties, and it's not satanic porn. I know, I'm sorry. Um, it updates every day. I started it in 2001, and it updates every day. Sorry, I've got con crud. <laughs> Uh, I'm Bill Holbrook. I do Kevin and Kel, and I've been doing it daily since 1995. I think, I, I think it's the longest running webcomic at this point. I, yeah. <laughs> My name is Ben Fisher. I've done a few standalone webcomics, including for the horror movie Chud, if you're familiar with that one, in conjunction with the filmmakers. and. A horror anthology for webtoons called Have You Any Fear and an upcoming uh, webtoons series that I don't think I'm supposed to talk about now so I may drop some hints but that's about it. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, I'm Adam Withers. I am the second half of Comfort and Adam and uh, my wife Comfort and I do the books The Uniques and Rainbow in the Dark. We also put out the <laughs> web series Kitty Game and released uh, like a year and a half ago The Complete Guide to Self-Publishing Comics through Random House. The only thing that we have not self-published is the book about self-publishing. <laughs> uh, I'm Alan. I'm one-third of uh, the comic uh, Kamikaze. We are a uh, sci-fi cyberpunk webcomic about uh, life 200 years after an apocalypse. And uh, we've been running since 2004, updating weekly. And, yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, well, um, yeah. Can I put forward a question? And that is, do web comics exist in 2018? I say that in terms of, if there are web comics, that means there are something, things that are not web comics. And I put forward the question, are all comics web comics at this point? Because every comic made now is on the internet in some form. I mean. Um. Reddit has a subreddit that it was suggested for me uh, of web comics. So web comic, I believe, yeah. web comics exist. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there are some comics that start in print, and that's you know right. it depends on what the goal of the artist is. And right. I think a lot of there's a there's a lot of artists who are just web comic, um, but I do think that their goal is print. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I could co-sign that. I mean, when Kamikaze started off, it was almost exclusively just was supposed to be a, a weekly web comic. We didn't even think about putting it into print until people were showing up at conventions, mm -hmm. looking at our business card and our banner, saying, mm-hmm, that looks fantastic. I'm not going to read it until it's in print. Uh, and I, I think to your question, Bill, um, I think, like, uh, there's a... a I think personally, there's a line between digital comics and web comics. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like you yeah. know, you're saying, um, there's you know, the, the intent is, is a big part of it. Yeah, I'd say there needs to be a broadening of definitions, generally speaking, okay. uh, as the internet has led us to have to do for a great many other mediums as well. We have to broaden what we think of when we think of a web comic, mm -hmm. because now all web comic used to mean traditionally was a comic on the web. Right. And like you say, all comics are on the web now. Yeah. So now we either need to subcategorize or we need to stop being so concerned about those distinctions and just think about how do I want to consume the comics that I read. Right. I think that's going to be a much bigger defining factor going forward is what does the audience want, not so much what can the creators produce. Yeah, and I think that um, in some respect it, the question goes to the craft of it, right? I do a lot of comics that are just for print. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of what I do are comics that are just for print. And well, you're right, they're, they're, they're made digitally available. The, the craft of writing a comic that's just a comic page that would normally have been in print that now I'm looking at on my iPad or on the computer monitor, it's a completely different writing process, and to me at least, than it is for writing a comic that's just meant to be however many panels it is on a computer screen, it's, right. it, the writing process is entirely yeah. different. Yeah. I'm assuming the drawing is as yeah. well. I, yeah. I write, I don't draw. Yeah. Right. Less well, speaks to what I think is one of the biggest changes happening because of the broadening of webcomics presence is that as a creator, you're having to think of both formats simultaneously. Really? Yeah. You know that what you're producing is going to be on the web. You know or at least suspect that at some point it's going to be in print. So you have to think, how is this going to work in a weekly format? And how is this going to work in a monthly or bi-monthly format, however it releases physically?
can it be interesting and entertaining enough in small chunks but not feel like repetitive and like it's a constant stop start when I put it all together into a single volume yeah. Uh, it's a balancing act people are still trying to figure out. And, and the new wrinkle is mobile because yes. there's, there's, there's platforms like Line Webtoon that, Webtoon, want, yep. that want basically single panels at a time yeah. that, that you then just go and then and then and then sort of like the, the Reese's Pieces for, for ET. And it's getting a lot of young creators in trouble because they build something that only functions on your phone. Right. And if they ever found real success there, where do you go? What do you right. do? How, I can't print this. It's just single panels. And it completely transforms the way that an artist builds tension visually, the way that a writer builds tension over time, when you can only deliver in that like vertical thorn format over and over. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make it impossible, but it is something you have to <laughs> yeah. figure out. Right. Yeah. And print is so there's so much available now that you can do now that you could not never do before right. that you can still print a book that is a single panel I bet you you could start printing books that are cell phone format size yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. oh dude yeah. Yeah. do it yeah. do it I want to see it yeah. I want to yeah. see it I want yeah. it to look like a cell phone and I want it to open up <laughs> yeah, yeah and I, I can actually speak to that a little bit directly from having worked with Webtoon the, you're exactly right they're, the creative, the writing process is entirely different there because it's just every, it's just splash pages, right? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, just one panel at a time. And they occasionally, things that are originally published on Webtoon, as some of you probably know, do become print media eventually. And a, a significant percentage of those panels have to be redrawn yeah. for the page. So for the artist, it's a whole bunch of extra work because yeah. you're, you drew it originally and you've got to redraw upwards of 50% to make it fit on a traditional format. Yeah. So it, it really does change the game. Yeah. Something that we always suggest, uh, Comfort and I do a lot of teaching as well as our comic production, and something we are always telling people is, think about your final product. Don't think about your first step, think about your last step, and try to plan ahead, plan for the long term. Just because you're only doing things in this format for now, doesn't mean that's the only format you're ever going to want to use. And if through your initial planning you can be prepared for other steps later, Maybe you won't have to do as much redrawing. Maybe you won't have to do as much restructuring and reconfiguring if you know where you wanted to go from the start. Yeah, it always helps to draw at a high resolution, like mm -hmm. 600 DPI, because you can get it down to 72 DPI for the web, but you still have the original high resolution file if you want to go into print. Yeah, it's just really hard to go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think enhance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enhance, enhance. Go left, go left. Well, this is, <laughs> this next gets to the production, which is: Do you draw the strip or your work in a on a um, Cintiq or on still pen and ink? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, for us personally, we, we just made a a transition. Um, we, we used to be doing things, we have a, a style which is very much like uh, an animated movie where you have like a character art style and then you have a background style. Mm -hmm. And for a long time we were doing it like traditional animation style, we'd do, it, we'd do a rough, then we'd have a, like a traditional light box for animation and it's, <laughs> our lead character artist would come in and she would trace over all the characters and take my wild weasel in a hurricane <laughs> scribbles and turn them into something coherent. And that would get scanned in, and in Photoshop things would happen, uh, bad bad things. Um, <laughs> but now we've, we've kind of optimized the process because now if I draw straight on the Cintiq, not only can I press undo, which is fantastic when I'm, <laughs> yeah, or I can erase infinitely without <laughs> ripping the paper, which I do a lot of, um, and. Uh, so we're just straight at Photoshop now, um, and it's also easier for her because she can literally just be in her pajamas back at home and you know be cleaning up the file. Um, and there are some parts of doing the, the digital digitally that I feel like have kind of shifted our team dynamics personally. What was the question? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, and that I yeah no I um. I was thinking about how I went to the, uh, I saw the original covers of the first Superman comics in a museum, and uh, the pages were yellowing, but the whiteout was still white. And you could see where, if there was any, like, cut and paste was literal cut and paste. If they wanted yeah. to change something, they'd draw it somewhere, cut out the piece of paper, and glue it to the page, and tape it to the page. Um, 
And so yeah, the undo the undo button is amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And so so yeah, I uh, uh, my husband got me a Wacom, uh, and I had been using Photoshop, but then we you know switched over to Clip Studios, Mega Studios, um, and I tried to do it all on on the line on the computer, but I found that penciling my layout totally changed if I penciled on a piece of paper versus penciling on the computer. So I pencil on a on a piece of paper and scan it in, and then I have templates in Photoshop, and uh, you can make your own um, uh, font and just type out, you know. And so you just make a font, and so it still looks like it's hand done. Yeah. Type um, your own ransom letters. What? <laughs> Type your own ransom letters. Yeah. <laughs> Hooray. There's a little bit. I need. I need. Can I have five thousand dollars for myself? <laughs> Am I worth that? Um, well, I. At one time, I considered myself really cutting edge because I would draw my strips in on pen and ink on a piece of paper, scan it into my computer, and then work on it di- digitally in Photoshop. I thought that was really cut- cutting edge, and now I find out that's old school. <laughs> <laughs> I still do it, but it's uh, I, I think you you still draw with pen and ink. Wow. Where's the undo button on that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And you got to be careful. Yeah. When you make that transition, your whole mind changes fast. Oh. Yeah. We only started doing exclusive digital drawing uh, like a year and a half, two years ago. Mm-hmm. And already, every time I'm drawing something, I find my hand twitching for key commands. Right, yeah. I try to push that undo that's yeah. on the thing. I was just doing a commission for somebody at this show earlier today, <laughs> and it was a two-figure piece. And I was so frustrated because one of the heads was like fractionally too big <laughs> Fra- and I had redrawn it and it was still fractionally too big and I'm like my kingdom for a lasso tool control, <laughs> control team just control. let me just it's so perfect in every way but it's just big enough to be noticeable so yeah you get used to the to the freedom of digital really quickly uh, I, I use the same laptop I've been using for my scripts the whole time it's not changed for me <laughs> How, how many people here uh, have a webcomic? They're doing a webcomic. It's publishing. It's yeah. Okay, so... How many so, want to? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, I, I have two questions. Can I yeah. sure. jump in? Cool. Of uh, what... Uh, how, do you, how do you get an audience? What, you know, advertising and stuff to use? And, and how do you make money? <laughs> 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 You're in the wrong panel. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it changes. I mean, you go through. I, I, since 1995, I've gone through about 15 different business models, and now it's down to begging. Uh, I, I think it's called Patreon. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the <laughs> online version of the hat on the corner with the harmonica. Yeah. Yeah. You know, please. Yeah. <laughs> Why lie? I need to draw comics. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it, it, I mean, that's that's pretty much where we're at. I'm, I, I'm actually really curious about people's thoughts on how they're, they're, they're promoting their comic now. Um, one thing which happened this year in the web comic world is one of the major ad networks for web yeah. comics went down. Mm-hmm. Um, the Project Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, they 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 closed up shop after eight. Years yeah. or so, yeah. and um, their the, the financial model just wasn't viable anymore because yeah. banner ads just are just auto blocked yeah. at this point. And even that was just a recognition of a change that had already been happening, right? For years. Yeah. Um, I, I, for, personally, for us, we were part of a couple mm-hmm. sort of collectives of other comics that are like us. So it's sort of a you know the Amazon suggests sort of like if you like you know, <laughs> girl power, you might like <laughs> <laughs> you might like us. It's completely totally different, but anyway. <laughs> Um, and uh, just lots of social media, yeah. lots, and, and these things. Yeah, th- well, this is this is it for us. There is one thing that I don't think has changed. Yeah. Um, even though all of the specifics will shift constantly, and you have to be aware of those shifting sands, uh, the one thing that I don't think has changed is you have to know who your audience is. Um, you know what your story is. You should be able to break it down into at least a simple concept for you to understand. Who are the people who would like that story? Who are the people who are already reading stories like that that might be interested in yours? And you've got to find where they're at and jump in front of them and say, <laughs> um, 
So right now, what is that? It's it's Facebook groups, it's hashtagging, it's Instagramming, it's find ways to make sure that people looking for the thing you do can have a chance at finding you out there. Now that is only going to do so much of it because you're still like, it used to be a small fish in a big pond, now you're like a piece of kelp in the ocean <laughs> of noise out there. Um, and for that, the most effective thing that we've ever found has been conventions. Yeah. Because you're physically in front of people. You're shaking somebody's hand, showing them this is our comic, letting them look through it, telling them what it's about. And the human connection person to person, as we become increasingly digital and increasingly disconnected from other people, making a personal physical contact with somebody has so much more power than it ever has before. You remember that. We have been fortunate in our work, Comfort and I, to have built enough of a following to have been doing comics full time for almost a decade. But in all of that time, every single one of our biggest super fans are people we've met at conventions. Yeah, there's nothing, Absolutely. Yeah, n nothing quite like saying, I too exchange oxygen and you know, <laughs> occupy a physical yeah. floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People don't think we're real. Yeah. It's true. It doesn't feel real. Otherwise, you wouldn't say those things on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, a tangent, yeah, a tangent to like the, they don't think you're real. Like this week, for like the first year, time ever, we had to put up like a, hey, sorry, we missed the post this week because we're we were a Dragon Con, you know, mini comic, and it was like the first time we'd ever drawn ourselves in the comic. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments says, oh, so that's what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. The, the, going back to uh, uh, important things, I forget where it was, but um, consistency. Um, the, the, the people, you know, finding your people, uh, making sure that you post something on a regular basis and, and pick a schedule and stick to it. And so that when you get people come and find you, um, they can come back and then they right. stay that you know if, if you miss an update you're you know you're gonna lose them but yeah, yeah. posting the the oh, i'm drunk right now yeah. um that that post yeah. works yeah. Well, yeah, we, we nothing, got that advice nothing kills an audience faster than a long unexplained hiatus oh yeah, yeah. um so if you do take a hiatus tell them why and when you, you'll be back and then stick to that deadline um because if they don't think it's ever coming back they'll never come back yeah they wander off so much of fandom. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So much of fandom is about habit. Yeah. It's about getting into a routine and just sticking with the routine. Right. It almost doesn't matter what you're posting. The fact that you're posting something all the time makes sure that you remain part of somebody's routine. Right. My brother actually said, "You know, I don't really identify with your comic. I don't think it's very good." <laughs> But you post every day, <laughs> and so I still check it. That's, that is some Gee, quality Eric. brothering right there. Family. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say, especially for those of you who are, who are just wanting to start out for your own to get to the consistency, this is true whether it's web comics or physical media comics, front load when you start out, mm -hmm. right? So before your first comic goes live, doesn't matter if it's a single issue hard copy or whether it's a web comic, you should have a bunch in the tank already so that you, at least at a minimum, your first however many that are coming out are definitely going yeah. to come out. Because if you want to kill your comic instantly, it's get one thing out there or two and then take your hiatus. You're done. No, yeah. you, so, you, you've at least got to front load a bunch. Yeah, yeah so we, we really could have used that advice. <laughs> so, so because we're a narrative story, we had this prologue at the front of our thing and it's like 20 odd pages. And so we build up this great big front load, but then we realize the main character doesn't show up in this until like page 23. Yeah. And if we're posting weekly, I don't can't wait half a year. <laughs> so we just dumped it all on like, the first day, and then and then we had nothing. And so, <laughs> so I was like, all right, we've set our standard. So now we have to keep up to it. <laughs> well, but that brings yeah. up the other point: right. is you want to front load right. so that you work out your kinks right. before you have the audience. Right. <laughs> That's also true. You find right. out yeah. before anybody sees it that you've screwed a, up a protagonist oh, yeah. badly, right. and you need to rework it. But fortunately, you're the only one who knows that yeah. so far. Yeah. And if this is the hey. first comfort love, ladies hey. and gentlemen. Hey. Yeah, especially if this is your first comic. There's things that you can only learn about making comics by making comics. And until you're actually doing it in the trenches 
every day working at it, you don't know what you don't know necessarily. So building up that front load both gets you a lot of cushion for your release schedule, but it also means that if you're going to make any flubs, you do them well in advance, and you do that stuff in private, and you can streamline it by the time you're actually on a schedule. Can I add to that really quick? By all means, uh, Comfy, welcome aboard. Uh, so if Adam didn't say this already, uh, so our first book that we did, Uniques, we started back in 2009 when we don't, we didn't quite know what we were doing with comics. And so we did all the way till issue nine with that, the first big story arc. And then we had to break to do another thing. And when we came back to it, our magnum opus, we were like, oh my God, we have to go back and rework this and make a director's cut because otherwise which it is just not don't something look you good. should ever so, do so the point ever. is is that sucks it was a great experience for us and a lot of people can learn from us sucking and not sucking so much but the point is is don't start with your magnum opus <laughs> start with something small if we had been smart and did rainbow in the dark first much better tiny story work your way up then when you're awesome move to your big guy. So my friend has two comics and one is a stick figure journal comic and the other one is a magnum opus that's you know full color and plot and has all these characters and everything and everyone loves the stick figure <laughs> journal <laughs> comic. It's wonderful. Um, but there's a lot, most of you here want to do a comic. You have an idea for it. It's not done yet. It's not ready yet. You don't have a writer. You don't have an artist. You know, you're still working out the kink. You're not good enough yet to do it. That's bullshit. You need to do it right now. Mm -hmm. You are never going to be ready. It is never going to be done. You are never going to be good enough because I still mm -hmm. sit down to do the comic and go, this comic isn't funny enough. This art isn't good enough, but it's a deadline. And it has to be up, so I have to post it. And what kills me is that the comics mm -hmm. that I think are amazing, mm -hmm. nobody cares. Like, it gets, like, barely any likes on Facebook. And the comics that was 3 o'clock in the morning and I was like, this shit needs to be done. I want to go to bed. I'm just going to like do this that's cringeworthy because it's not very good and people adore it. Yeah. And and so the thing is with especially with social media and everything now, you have no excuses. You take a picture of a squiggle with your phone and post it to Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, you have a webcomic. And you just have to keep doing it and it's just turning it out. Cuz the first year you do the comic, you're going to realize it's hard. And the second year you do the comic, you're going to realize it's hard and you're not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and people are insulting you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Somebody loves it. Somebody hates it. Somebody yeah. says it's the worst thing yeah. ever. Somebody's <laughs> like, you shouldn't even. Why? You got that perspective wrong. Oh, yeah. yeah. To, to add in, to sort of feed into all of that too, um, and this is again true whether it's web comics or you're attacking prose or whatever you're working on, absolutely just get it done because the first thing you do is going to be the worst thing you do. It right. just is. So just get it out there, work your way through it. No matter how much you love it right now, you're going to be done with it and look back and be like, oh, that's not nearly what I thought I was. And that's fine. Like, that's true for every human being who does it. And then that makes you going to be that much better for the next thing through. But you got to get through what you're worst at first. You get through the worst stuff. Get on to what you know, make yourself yeah. better. Level yeah. up. Yeah. But you yeah. gotta yeah. you gotta start at level one. Yeah, yeah. 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 you really can't start at level ten. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really think that every no web does. comic artist should have above their monitor. Perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. There's a and I wish I could remember the name of the artist. Uh, in college, we learned about this artist who was banned from his own gallery shows and museums because he would go and pull the art down off of the wall and keep working on it. He had security be dragging him out of his own museum uh -huh. because they're like, no. He had to work on uh, wood because he kept working the, pe the, the canvas until wow. it ripped. Oh, wow. So yeah, no, don't post it, work on the next thing, don't look yeah. back, don't read the yeah. comments. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't read the comments. Yeah, don't read the <laughs> I think comments. That's, yeah. Uh, although you do find some great fans there every you once can. in a while. I, I love that some of my fans are sane and they respond to the comments that I can't respond to yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, oh, you are batshit crazy. I can't say anything because then it's like the creator coming down and raining havoc on you and I'm like, no, no, I have to, I have to stay quiet and luckily one of the other fans goes, hey, uh, you're batshit crazy and I'm like, oh, good. You said it because I can't. The thing I always try to remember about dealing with social media and comments and all that jazz is that it takes two to drama 
Yeah. And if you don't engage with it, it'll die down. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll it, maybe or maybe it burns for a long time, but it burns in this little patch over here, and you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to confront that. Yeah. You don't have to even recognize its existence. Just pour concrete on top of it. And it, <laughs> it takes to yeah. And you know what? If you've got if this is on any site where you have any level of control over the comments, you're free to get rid of that stuff. Yeah. You don't look bad for getting rid of it. You have to maintain that presence. You have to manage your presence. And sometimes that means booting some trolls, but what else are you going to do? So don't engage on their level. That's how they win. You can't beat them at oratory. They're not trying to have a conversation. I, I would do a polite response that I'd be like, I had somebody who say, you suck. And I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, you feel that way. And usually I would get, oh my god, you read my comment? You read my email? Oh, uh, I didn't mean you suck. What I meant to say, <laughs> it's like, oh, you're a real person that read this. Again, they don't think we're real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, do we want Questions. Um, as Einstein, oh, cool. Um, as Einstein said, never argue with stupid people. They'll drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no, that uh, I had a lot of people who said, uh, "Well, I was just having a really bad day," and and they they just spouted off and didn't you know context. They they were like, "Oh, okay, I was in a bad place when I when I you know yelled," or they they just the profanity that you go, oh, you, you have issues. This has nothing to do with my comic. This has nothing to do with my art or anything. You're going through your own thing, and I'm just going to let you do that. You, you, you just happen to be the, the, the stranger they happen to bump into yeah. on the street, oh, metaphorically. Yeah. 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 Or trying to use your soapbox. Right. The, right. Yeah, they're walking into your forum, and they're trying to use your audience for their own... Not all Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> they actually friggin' said on my forum, not all oh Nazis. And wow. you're like, oh, oh, bless your heart, wow. you little troll bastard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's when I hit the delete button. Yeah. <laughs> We're down in a hole. Yeah. Let's dig our way out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so my question uh, kind of goes back to something that you had mentioned earlier um, with respect to people still wanting printed comics. Mm -hmm. We millennials have killed newspapers and uh, cable television and no, radio <laughs> yeah. uh, in favor of the internet. Why are we still asking you to print books? Because they look so nice on the shelf. People like physical things. People All you like hipsters them. out there still <laughs> like books. And books are a nice thing to sell. Like, it feels personal. Yeah. It's portable. Yeah. 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 When the power goes out, yeah. I can read a book. <laughs> And books could be autographed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's they hard could to be get personalized. Um, there are advantages that books have that a PDF doesn't. There's a nostalgia factor that is made every time you purchase a new copy of a thing, because you remember that thing. You remember that purchase. Sometimes, I mean, depending. But you're never you never make any emotional connection to a piece of digital media, because I can't take that file and be like, oh, I remember looking at this file when da 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 I don't it's, know, Dancing Baby works. is still a little, little every time <laughs> I can't stop that feeling start. Like, you can have a memory of a moment, but there is something to tactile presence in the same way that there's something to music, something to scent. The, the physical sensations bond to the memory centers of the brain in a way that pure visual recognition doesn't. So we will always have this connection. When you smell the book, you will have that connection. When you hear the music you were listening to when you were reading that thing, you'll see the images from the pages in your mind. Uh, and you, you just can't get that from digital media. Unquestionably, print is getting smaller. Uh, the, I think single issue comics are going to go away. I'm yeah. amazed they haven't oh, already. They were dying 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was Nobody's made any profit off of those in a decade at a minimum. But. Books aren't going anywhere, uh, no matter how hard the publishing industry tries to kill themselves. <laughs> and, and that and long, amazing, slow suicide. The, the you, so, so where do you guys get stuff printed? Because it used to be you have to go to Canada. China. Where, you, you do China. Korea. Well, well, we actually know, print locally. Three thousand yeah. books, yeah. which yeah. is yeah. just kind of ridiculous. Yeah. 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 We uh, have a basement. Yeah. Oh. And, you know, for us, uh, so the numbers are. 
and this is the uh, this is what you have to work up for don't do this when you start no, it takes not a ready long in the time no. to get there so we print like 2000 of a run of rainbow in the dark which is one of our series and um, other friends of ours work for other publishers and they print up 5,000 copies. So our friends who get 5,000 copies done through another publisher on average get around $3,000 for that. We with Rainbow in the Dark with the 2,000 copies make $35,000 profit and that's just the difference. That's why we do it. On that's why we self-publish. Now, yeah. as a self-publisher, we have to pay for all the printing. We have to manage all the marketing. Yeah. To we be have clear, to deal with all the distribution. dollars Profit. Right, which right. then has After to immediately expense. get reinvested in sure. the next thing Absolutely. we're going to print and all these other things. And it, you're looking to sell them to then continue to make more yeah. profit, but right. that's the cycle things go on. Yeah. But when you start, if you do print, you're doing, you're going to do print on demand for years. Because I need 20 copies. Right. Yeah. Because so I don't know if anybody's going to want these. Once you're <laughs> off that cycle and you know that you're going to move them, then you can go to something else. But you got to know you can move them because otherwise you're stuck with an entire basement or garage or whatever. I have a reinforced hallway. Yeah, just right. <laughs> box. So, so I use uh, CreateSpace. That's Amazon Print On Demand. And, and yeah, you print up 20 of them instead of 2,000 yeah, because, yeah. yeah, storage is yeah. A storage just, is hard. Yeah. Uh, and that also is, is a learning curve for, for printing, that you realize that the si you're figuring out the size of the book, some of the sizes are more universal, you figure out, oh my god, this is what bleed is, this is what resolution is, oh my, the, the hash, the, the grayscale isn't working out, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly you, again, yeah. you don't know what the problems are until you do it, so you have to go do it, just upload a PDF file to, to create space, get one book for, for three dollars, and then go, oh, this is crap. Okay, I gotta totally re redo the whole thing. Just, just as one other like prepping things, just an idea. So we also put out our stuff on Webtoon. We just started that like a month and a half ago. Very new, but that's where the new hotness is. That's where everybody finds their comics. All right, cool, we'll do that. But in order to prep our books and put them into the webtoons format we didn't just do everything at the current webtoon size but because oh no that's going to change someday it will so you do it at a higher dpi so whatever it goes to you're prepped and set and you can move things around with no problem if it changes on you which it will so that's why we haven't yeah. killed off oh books. sorry yeah. <laughs> well i use lulu to yeah um Print my book collections because they not only print them, they do the fulfillment of yeah. actually getting yeah. the books to the audience, and they collect the sales tax. Right. Which, if you've ever tried to have 50 different sales tax uh, yeah. situations, yeah. that would drive you up the wall, and I couldn't do it. So yeah. thank you for thank you, Lulu. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're a little bit of an oddity. We actually print uh, local. We have a, a printer in, in Roswell, and um, we. We had, we've done both of our books through Kickstarters. Um, so because we had you know good response with our Kickstarter, we were able to basically invest that into a, a big arsenal of books. But it does create the problem of you know the, the, the basement. You know, it's like, all right, now I have all these fantastic books which my fans have helped make bring to life. Now now what? <laughs> Convention. <laughs> Conventions yeah. Yeah. online. Yeah. Since the Kickstarter for my dolls, yeah. I have now been paying monthly fees on storage units for my yeah. dolls. Yeah. And so yeah, <laughs> Kickstarter is a great way to, to you know test the waters and stuff. Uh, I was wondering about uh, turnaround time, be it for scripts or pages or panels. So like YouTube do it every single day, so your turnaround time is going to be smaller. But you guys are just doing strips, right? Um, so I'm like curious about what the difference between like turnaround time on strips from even just scripting to finish versus like on pages or full issues. Uh, three hours a comic. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, actually, just drawing one of my strips takes about 90 minutes, but that doesn't include the writing, and that could be like a flash of an instant or six hours of tearing my hair out. It's usually the latter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when we, we did some tests on it because we are a weekly webcomic and we do the full, you know, full shebang. Um, the first time we measured, it was we were not efficient in the process. It was like 86 man hours a week, 
the, between the three of us, and now I think it's down to 24. But like, like we're, we're, we're very over ambitious on our pages. We're doing the magnum opus. <laughs> Per page, yeah. Uh, it's hard for us to gauge specifically the time because we work on the writing and the drawing and the color like so piecemeal at, at a time. We don't. It's not like we're sitting and we're just going to write this issue and then we're going to draw this. Issue. We're usually working many issues in advance uh, and on multiple issues at the same time. Uh, but I, I think for drawing, drawing is the easiest thing to nail down. Mm -hmm. And if we are doing really good and tearing and we've got nothing else going on that day, we can get one fairly simple page drawn in a day. That never happens. There is never a day where we're just on a super roll and there is nothing else that we have to deal with that day. Because there's always something else you have to do. Now, very quickly. Something that I've been noticing in, in media, and this is not necessarily for your starting, because your starting stuff is going to suck, but as you go, do learn to take your time in part, here's why, because there's so much media out there, so much, you want to make your stuff eventually <laughs> worth people's time. Don't waste their time. Do something good. So it might take you a little longer every once in a while, but it can be worth it depending on what you're doing. So keep that in mind. Yep. Okay. Here's the box. The box. The box. <laughs> this is a question that kind of relates to another one, but you've had some you you've had some controversial issues at times. I as a fan of Bills for a long time, I remember the issue when Angelique, Kevin Sissick crossed over the whole death and rebirth angle. That was a thing. So how you deal with when fans have you had an issue, hop an issue with that? With what what thing you do? Well, I do listen to my readers. Um, I do read the comments section, and I have a and I'm very impressed by the level of dialogue in my comic section. It's, I rarely ever have to deal with a firestorm, so I listen to them and hear what they're having to say, and that does influence me uh, in terms of what gets, well, what comes out of my creative process. Um, the greatest issue, I mean, the greatest thing that happened from comment sections that I found out was when I introduced Bethany into Fast Track and I thought she was just going to be kind of a one-off um, character that I would get some goth jokes out of but when the strip started running I just got a, emails and comments and Twitter things of just people just gulping I love Bethany so I said I better do more stuff with her <laughs> she, she's become kind of the foundation of the strip now so that was one time when listening to my readers was a 100% positive. I've had, in one week I had two different emails and one said, I liked your stuff back when you were angry and violent and now you're all fluffy and soft. And the second email was, uh, I liked you back when you were cute and innocent and now you're the female equivalent of the man's show. And I said, you two need to figure out what I am <laughs> and let me know. And so, yeah, some of it is just, you know, oh, I don't like this, you should do this. And you're like, oh, great, well, it's a free comic, so you can go um, have fun by yourself. <laughs> now, on the other side, I did, uh, on Saturdays, I do a what not to say in the bedroom. And it's a black panel, and it's things like, uh-oh, or, you know, where's that spoon going? Or, you know, yeah. Weird, you know, out-of-context things. And, um... The actor who's in uh, Ghostbusters, who was wandering around just giving people shots of vodka and stuff, and he was just being absolutely ridiculous, and he would go up to people and steal their fries and go, nobody will believe you, and he'd wander off. Bill, Bill Murray. Yeah. Yes, Bill yes. Murray. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you know, some, <laughs> some guy that you've done something amazing, and they go, nobody's going to believe that you've done this amazing thing. So I said, what not say in the bedroom, nobody will believe you. <laughs> oh, no. oh no out of context that is not no 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 and I got a couple of very nice emails going sweetie no and I said oh 
<laughs> that wasn't what I intended, that wasn't what I meant, and I took that down. I took that down immediately because from a different perspective, it was a very, very different comic. And so, so yeah, there's some stuff that you're like, hey, you have a problem with this because of you. And on the other side, you go, oh no, that's not how I intended it. I need to change that. And so it's something different. Um, so yeah, sometimes you listen just because, yeah. I do some, some things like that, but my wife always catches them and they never see print. <laughs> Yeah, and a nice thing about having sort of multiple people, you know, see you have Editors. multiple eye eyeballs yeah. is you do have the ability to catch some stuff. But even in some cases where you have you have a bunch of eyeballs on something, it still can go, and you do need someone like a, a fan to say, uh, "Is that really what you intended?" Um, and it's like, "Oh, that, that's that's a good point. That's a power dynamic we really should have thought about before we moved into this phase." Yeah. Got another question over here. Yeah. Hi, um, for those of us who are not multi-talented, I was wondering for those of you who, who work on these um, comics with collaborators, um, how did you go about networking and, and finding the right collaborator? Um, any tips on that? I asked her out. I love you. <laughs> I very uh, uh, so we have worked with other people and we sort of either a work as editors on stuff or b we write and then somebody else draws and you want to be searching through artist alleys you want to be talking to your friends you want to be going through whether it's a deviantart or art station or whatever and finding people who do pages or who are other great writers and you want to ask them questions and befriend them, get to know them, and then try out something. And when you're ready, do five pages. Yeah, I think the important thing in our experience with collaboration has been to try to connect with people on a human level first, um, because their skill as an artist is secondary in almost every way to your ability to work together as people. Right. And if you can't have a connection, and from their end too as an artist if a writer approaches us and you can tell that this is just a super mercenary thing where they want us to toe the line and do what they say like that it's going to be a really bad fit i don't want that job i don't want to have to work with that person it's not like whatever they're going to pay isn't going to be worth it so find a way to connect with somebody as a person first you know try to get to know them in a friendly way first don't make it about hey i've got this book and maybe you may you know who are they and what connection do you have to them and once you can build that bridge a little bit the more rapport. Yeah. build that rapport a little bit more then it's a lot easier for them to be interested in whatever you have to say or to offer because I might just like hanging out with you anyway why not do a project together right I, I think we were lucky with, with Havana uh, Carrie and I are, were a couple long before we started working on Kamikaze and it was sort of a, sort of a relationship project. It was sort of our baseball yeah. we tossed back and forth for years before it was ever actually a, yeah. a formalized project. Um, uh, we were we were originally a pitch for an animated series, and we had uh, a director friend who was helping us out with the process, and we needed someone to, br to come up, bring in to, to do the the character art process, and he had she, uh, Havana was a friend of him, so we, we were able to kind of you know, again do a sort of a test drive and get to know her as. A friend first, and but it was also a bit of a professional relationship too. Uh, so when it eventually morphed into a comic, it was okay. We know each other. We you know we understand enough about how we work together, and we trust each other enough to be able to say, all right, you, you, yes, we know how to communicate with each other. Yes, yeah. we know more or less what each other's damage is. <laughs> yeah. You know, all right, we can now proceed to throw ourselves at a comic week after week after week after week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost always said with a sneer of disdain. When people talk about, oh, it's all who you know in this industry. But it makes sense when you think about it. If all things are equal, who would you rather work with? The person that you already have a good relationship with or somebody you've never met before? Who, who knows what they're like? Who knows what they're like to work with or whether they'll flake out on you? So, you know, it, this is a relationship business. Be sociable. Be sociable. That's, that's the lesson. Yeah. That's really hard for most cartoonists, by the yes. way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and speaking as someone who has, is the worst artist imaginable, um, so just just on the writing side, for those of us who aren't lucky enough to be romantically involved with somebody who's very yeah. talented yeah. in that regard, <laughs> like that's, that's nice if you can make that work out. But when you're first starting out, in particular, yeah, 
places like DeviantArt, the sort of online forums, those are genuinely invaluable. You can, you can peruse through those and start to make a few contacts and then see if you mesh, you know, you know email back and forth, kind of see if it, it makes sense to work together if you, and, can, and start from there. And then once you get past that initial place, and initially, if you're just starting out, that's all you've got. You're just, you're gonna have, looking for people online, whether it's writers or artists, whatever you're looking for, that's, that's and that's great, that's, that, that works fine. Um, and then once you start to build that a little bit, referrals actually go a long way. I can't count the number of times I've reached out to somebody I trust and know well in the industry and say, hey, I need a colorist for this. Can you give me two or three names that you think would work well with me? You know me. And, and, but you can't even get to that conversation until you start out knowing somebody to ask the question to. So, I mean, really, you, you sort of have to, it, 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 for someone like me, I really was a shot in the dark. I really was just reaching out online to places saying, hey, I like the way you drew Conan. I'm kind of doing a book you know, with, with fantasy. Let's talk. I mean, it was really just that simple until eventually I you know, connected with different artists. Another question, Nick? Uh, I just wanted to uh, add, add on an additional comment uh, to, you know, it's a lot easier for a writer to learn how to draw than for an artist to learn how to, how to write. So if you're looking for that col collaboration, just go ahead, try to do the thing you think you can't do and either they won't care or you'll get good at it. Yeah. And well, if you yes. don't get good at it, at least you'll have some respect for it. Yeah, very nice. The, uh, the most popular comic on the internet is XKCD. Oh, yeah. Stick it's a stick figure. Yeah. 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 You, you do as much as you can yourself, and even if you think it's terrible, it's at least a way that when you show it around, the, the artist or the, the writer can look at it and go, okay, I like this story. I want to work on this. I can, And it also teaches you as far as, oh, yeah, I wrote this page, but now that I stick figure it out, it, it's not working the same. You know, it, it changes how you look at the story. And it goes back to our idea of you don't have to do your big story first. If all you can do is draw something yourself for now, write something based on what your level is. You know, write something that works as a cute stick figure story and play to that strength. And then at least you're releasing and you're potentially building a fan base and a name for yourself as you're trying to connect with an artist that can do the other story that you really want to do. And do some, some basic yeah. uh, uh, contracts. Like when you send your baby, to an artist, like, hey, can you can you do this? And they're like, oh, this is brilliant. I think I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, go. Oh no, this was totally my idea. I had this idea ten years ago. Um, so yeah, be be careful who you send your baby. to. Protect yourself. Yeah. Question here. Yes, uh, particularly for Mr. Holbrook, um, how you feel about social media? What? Um, especially for social. What do you think of social media for? Um, or putting, getting out your comments? Oh, uh, social media is pretty, pretty much the ocean that we're all swimming sure. in. It's the necessary um, it's evil. A, <laughs> it isn't even an option anymore. Right. No. Um, it, it's, if you don't do it, you are just not letting people find out about you. Don't do a webcomic. You're not going <laughs> to, yeah. yeah. It's, Gotta it, do social it's media. a basic requirement. Yep. So, so I'm on uh, Facebook, social media, uh, I mean, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Tumblr, but not under my own name. I have, all, the, all those are my characters who are on Facebook, who are on Twitter, who are on Tumblr. So I let them be the identity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, How about the common name for the common name? Yeah, that, um, it, um, I don't do that, but I could. But that's a good way of marketing. What what I have in Kevin and Kel is, is that I have Rudy Duclaw be the guy, Facebook presence, and so he responds as to his readers as Rudy. Um, so it provides a bit of distance, and as far as I'm concerned, and it helps establish a relationship between the character and the readers, um, which is what my main goal is, because I want the readers to become invested in the character. So what better way than to talk to him? Whatever you put on social media, make sure that your your name or your you know story name, whatever is a Googleable thing, because not if, but when 
someone takes it and shares it on Tumblr or something and it's somewhere beyond your control, someone can actually find you again. Go, go, oh, this is really great art that, that I found on Reddit. You, they can actually Google whatever, you know, put your URL, put your name, put something that they can find you again. We have another question, I thought, right here. Okay, this is kind of building off the, the, the social media question, but with Kevin and Kel, the different aspects actually, I find, be able to give a little more space, give you more breathing room than the, than the three, than the three panels and five panels on weekends that Bill has, because he's able to flesh out some some behind the scenes stuff. I can get a little more about info about Rudy from Facebook, Lindsay Fear on Tumblr, and even, well, yeah, and also you have a the Twitter arc for Catherine and the human side portal is totally on Tum is only on Twitter. Without the only Twitter, you won't understand that arc and how that changed and still ties back into the main Kevin Calvers. Right. What I do is um, within the three panels, I can only do so much world building. So all the all, all the social media things that you mentioned, I use as a, every week I write two or three paragraphs that comment and add to the story going on in the strip that if I'd put it into the strip itself would have slowed down the gag. So it's using social media as a world building tool. All right, one more question. Uh, yes, I have a question about um, when you're first starting out. Um, obviously, as you progress, uh, your art gets better. So have you ever looked back at what you first did and you're just like, oh man, this is crap. Do you go, is it worth it at that point to go back and fix it or should you just Unless keep going? you're in a shitty position like we were where you don't, had to move forward. Don't yeah. fix it. Don't, I, just so let, so let the past Garfield, be the past and move forward. <laughs> Garfield was completely different the first mm -hmm. comic mm -hmm. to, to now. Yeah. No, it's ideally you do get better and it's going to change. Right. And what's one, I love going to web comics and clicking on that first button <laughs> and like, seeing oh. how to go, this is completely different. Yeah. How did that happen? And you read through it and you don't notice the change. Mm -hmm. And at yeah. the end of it, you're like, that didn't change at all. Oh, oh, that first <laughs> one. Oh, no. So, so go for it, but like we said, do a smaller story to start. Cut your teeth and go back. If, if you ever want to see before and afters, come to our table. We did redo those sure units. And in the back of them, there's things of we sucked. And here's how here's we did why, it better. Here's how and why specifically right. we, we sucked. We do a whole we panel <laughs> where we do, it's called How to Make Comics and Not Suck, and it's all about And it's pretty much, it. don't be us. Don't. I don't yeah. look back, darling. I don't yeah. look back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and to, to sort of like, cat on that same sort of level yeah. of concept. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, when you, you, you have your, you have sorry, your level I'm one, you're gonna start level one, it's bad, you're gonna get to level 10, it's way better. When you're a level 10 character, you don't go redo the level one adventures again. You're done right. with those adventures. New, new level game 10 plus adventures. always yeah. makes harder Brilliant. stuff yeah. for Brilliant. you. Yeah. The bad guys are upgraded yeah. on new game yeah. plus. Do we have time for the one more comment? Yes. Hi, in relation to a comment that you made earlier, what are your thoughts of using your actual name versus an alias, especially if, let's say that your comic evolved point of getting polished something like that my personal philosophy has always been to use my real name to be straightforward and that includes when I'm making comments on random forums that includes everywhere I go I am me um, and that is for two reasons first off if somebody likes what I'm saying I want them to know who said it and be able to track me back uh, secondly because most of the success that we've had, uh, at least a lot of the success we've had, has come from that open honesty with our audience. The fact that there is no, there's no wall between us and the people who read our work. Um, we are just straightforward. Here's who we are. Here's what we do. Here's what we think. Here's how we feel. Um, if you are following us, if you're interested in us, you know us. Um, people it's a personal have, connection. People want to have that connection. They want to feel like they get you, like they're part of your story somehow. And if you if you do everything behind a pseudonym, then who are you even really? You know, where does where do you end and the character that you're portraying begin? But if you do use a pseudonym, that be, that's now your brand, mm -hmm. and you have to start using that exclusively, pretty much, yeah. uh, for your presence. Right. I mean, so. Um, yeah, you have to be very careful about that. I mean, a, a great example of that from film is 
think about uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's, he hasn't wrestled in years, but he still has to use The Rock because yeah. that's his brand. Because that's how people know We have him. a yeah. friend, Jeff Chamba Cruz. And he's got to be Chamba forever yep. because that's what he operated but under. But some places, like, he's done work for IDW and stuff, and they won't do the Chamba, so then nobody knows it's him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that sucks. Yeah, so be careful before you go with screen name, like... Flying Butt Monkey 25, because that might be what you're stuck with. You seen the new piece from the Butt Monkey? <laughs> Here it is. That guy really cooks. Yeah. Here it is, the greatest piece of artwork by of our the generation. Butt Monkey. By butt monkey. <laughs> <laughs> monkey out. All right. So, okay. shall oh, so we? So where, where can where can you find us? Yeah. So I tomorrow I will physically be not mentally but physically. I will be over in the America's Mart Building 2, Floor 4, Aisle 600. Oh, we're in the same aisle. Yeah. 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 Yep. I'll be in the same place, but Aisle 5, uh, Table 502. I, uh, I'm actually, this is my last panel, and I did the last meet and greet and all that kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm out for Dragon Con. After this. But you can find me, but, yeah, uh, but you, you can find me online or Twitter or any of those kind of places. Um, Named a, I do a comic called The Great Divide, which is a, a, a weekly comic that you can try that too. But yeah. Awesome. So um, we will we're be... We're in the America's Mart, uh, floor four. Floor four, that's the comic and pop art alley for yep. anybody who's curious. It's table 623. Yep. And uh, same bat time, same bat channel with these guys, except uh, table 412, so... Row so four, four five, six. That's yeah. where the action is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're like, <laughs> and uh, you can you can find me on uh, uh, kamikazecomic.com. I'll have some cards up front here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Comfortatadam.com. Uh, comfort and Adam everywhere you go. Man. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right. All right.